morning. morning. Awesome. Okay, we just need to keep this participation thing going. Hey, if you wouldn't mind, uh, I'll just... Tell, share a couple of thoughts, but uh, before I do, if you wouldn't mind just in preparation of turning in your Bibles to John chapter 17, we're going to get there eventually. And so if you wouldn't mind just turning there now so that when we get there, and it'll be a little bit until we get there, but when we're there, you'll just be able to get right there and, and on we go and into it we'll go. Uh, hey, um, I love that song, Lord, I Need You. Because it's just this cry, it's this declaration that, God, there is not one minute of the day where I don't need you. And when the music stopped, your voice has filled this place with this declaration, Lord, I need you. And it really, it's an act of desperation. And to be, to make a declaration that we're desperate for God, God has got us right where he wants us. Because if we're desperate for him and we're seeking him, guess what we get? We get all of them. Like we get all of him, we get all of his love, we get all of his mercy, we get all of his grace, we get all of his strength, we get all of his power, and that is right where he wants his beautiful declaration that we get to sing that this morning and that we get to declare that this morning. The other thing that I just want to quickly mention is here we have a group of people that could be doing anything, they could spend their money any way that they want, and yet God has placed a burden on their heart uh, to go to India, and I just think that that is so cool that they're going to do that. And if God spoke to your heart and you thought, hey, you know what, maybe I would like to be a part of, well, they're leaving Thursday, so you're off the hook for that one. But we are going to Uganda this summer, and so if you're interested in that, there's still an opportunity for that. Uh, I know that there's going to be some trips to Nicaragua, and that'll be a little bit closer. But hey, consider, we're in this, we're in this crazy, fun, rowdy, relentless pursuit of God and his plans for our lives in 2018. If you're here with us for the first time this year, we're so glad that you are. I just want to bring you up to speed with where we've been. Last week, we started on this 21-day habit of seeking God first. And what we're, what we're doing as a church is we're seeking God first for where he wants us to serve him in 2018. Like there is a gifting in your life. There is a calling on your life that when you volunteer there, when you serve there, just by the nature of how God has wired you, you're going to bless others and you're going to bring glory and honor and people are going to praise God's name because of what he does in their lives. And as a church, we're on this 20 one day pursuit of saying, God, where is it you want to use me? And we're seeking him in two very specific ways. What we're doing is we're praying. So we're for over the 21 days, we're building this habit of seeking God first in prayer. And the other thing that we're doing is we're fasting. We've decided for 21 days that we're going to give something up that we really love, that we really value in an effort and in uh, just anticipation that we're going to seek a response from God and God is going to speak into our lives exactly where he wants to use us in 2018. I don't know how the first week has been for you, but we're not asking you to do anything that we as a staff aren't willing to do. And there have been some tough, tough moments. In fact, earlier this morning, I was sitting right down here, and what I uh, have sacrificed, while it pales in comparison, I know that it's absent from my life. And because it's absent, I want it, and there's some limitations that come. And so I'm just like, Lord, I want to say thank you that I'm completely dependent on you. I want to say thank you for the tiny inconvenience that I'm experiencing right now. Because I know at the end of the day, what I'm doing is I'm replacing that with you. And isn't God better than anything we could possibly ever have anyway? What, if you're inconvenienced for 21 days, but God forges in you a warrior molds you into a worry that you come out with a clearer conviction of what it is he wants you to do, I don't know about you, but that sounds like an awfully good trade to me. To know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if I do this, whatever this is that God says, that I'll be living smack dab in the center of his will for my life in 2018, I'm willing to be inconvenienced for that. Are you? Some people are like, bring it. Other people are like, I'm not so sure you're freaking me out right now. Okay, listen, man, don't be freaked out. Hey, if you're a guest, what I want to do is I want to invite you into this thing. And so I think we've got something like 50 books, maybe a, few, uh, a couple less than that. If we need to order more, we'll do it. But if you're new and you want to start this habit of seeking God first so that you too can live in the, right in the center of God's will and his plans for your life in 2018, if you knew that there was one thing that you could do that would guarantee absolutely 
absolute success for the year? I think you'd say yes to that. And so that's what we've been saying yes to. And you can pick a book up that will help you just uh, in, in seeking God in the prayers. And uh, that book is available over the place. And uh, so it's going to be awesome. Well, today, what we're going to do is I'm really excited. We are starting a brand new series that really just kind of builds off the grander vision for our lives in the talk that we had. And it started as an idea uh, in early 2017. We thought, man, I wonder what it is that people are highlighting and underlining and circling in their Bibles. They're writing in the margins and they're stuffing in their Bibles. I wonder what people are putting in their Bibles. I wonder what verses are sticking out to them that are sticky, that it's so good, that it was so helpful, that it, was, that it delivered hope. Maybe it was healing. Maybe it was a passage where you needed strength and God used that, that passage to just pour his strength into your life that day. But it's things that we call sticky. We highlighted it, we circled it, we underlined it because it stuck. It like stuck out in our lives. And man, if you've owned your Bible for longer than a year and you've been highlighting it, there's probably a lot of sticky stuff in there that maybe you've forgotten. And so my hope is over the next few weeks in this series, we'll kind of mine our Bibles and we'll mine the scriptures for things that stick in belief that it's going to fan the flame of our faith and we're going to grow and God is going to reveal what it is he wants us to do. And so uh, what I did is I asked the congregation, I just fired off an email to all you guys and a bunch of people responded, hey, here's what I have underlined and circled and here's just a few samplings from that. First one is a picture of a heart. I love this because somebody's little kid wrote on that. Don't you love the way little kids spell? There's something beautiful and innocent. And look at what a little kid wrote. That my heart, because it's the shape of the heart, my heart would magnify the Lord for he is worthy to be praised. Man, that kid's teaching us something right now. But that parent's got that stuffed in there. Why? So they can remember, Lord, help my kid walk in your ways all the days of their life. And that's a prayer we can all be praying for one another. That's a prayer that sticks right there, isn't it? Let's look again. This is a cool one, man. And uh, you can read the article if you've got like better than 20-20 vision. So let me just highlight the bottom of it for you because it's so true. This is something that they stuck in their Bible. One thing that I'm learning is how God often uses pain and struggle to teach, train, and use his followers. How many of us love to run from pain and struggle? And yet when we find ourselves there, that's where God can really do a work in our lives, where he can strengthen us. And that is a prayer that will stick. Lord, help me not run. But if I run, let me run to you. Lord, if I want to struggle, teach me. It's awesome. Here's somebody, a crocheted cross from a friend. I don't know how to crochet. I think that that's kind of cool. All right. Not that I'm going to learn, but I think it's cool you can do that. All right. My, and look at, the, look at this one. My ever-changing prayer list. It's, it's not stagnant. It's not like I put it in there and there it is. It's ever-changing. Is my seasons of life change? Is my, is my list of praises and is God answers my prayers and my requests change? Man, this is in my Bible, man. When I crack that thing, it's in there. I can see it. Meaningful daily devotion, just kind of a thought to go along with that. Family pictures, be praying for family. A bookmark with in God we trust. Man, that is a reminder that all of us need almost every minute of every day because we want to trust in our eyesight, don't we? We want to trust what we can see, what we can taste, what we can smell. Man, no, in God we trust. And then notes and verses written in the back. I think we've got a couple more. A quotation. This is kind of cool. I like this one. He died on a cross made of wood and yet built the hill on which it stood. Humility. And then a mustard seed. Why a mustard seed? What did Jesus say about a mustard seed? If you had faith the size of what? Then you could move a what? Man, aren't we always saying, I need a bigger faith. I need, I need a bigger faith. Jesus is saying, let's just right size that one for once. If you had faith the size of a mustard seed, which is about the size of a ball tip pen, if your faith was that big, you could tell a mountain to move and it would move. Mustard seed, Lord, help me have a faith that believes. And then I love this one, man. I love this. Anybody in here broken? I am. 
Brokenness is God's requirement for maximum usefulness. He's not looking for perfect people because they don't exist. He's just looking for imperfect people pursuing him, and he can use that. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. So, hey, these are things that people that stuck out to people that they stuffed in their Bible. These were thoughts that were sticky to them, and they didn't want to forget it. Well, I bet that you have some thoughts, and you've got some verses, you've got some prayers that you've highlighted, circled, underlined, stuffed in the margins, written in the margins, and they're sticky. And so we're calling it sticky stuff. And as you saw just on that short list, one of the themes that reoccurs over and over and over again is prayer. And so today I thought what I would do is I would start by just sharing uh, with you four prayers that stick. These are four prayers that if we'll pray these prayers, these are prayers that we can add in addition to the prayers that we're already praying in seeking God first. So these prayers are probably prayers that you've heard before, that you've read before, and maybe we're just reminding you of them again. But if we'll pray these prayers, and there may be one more in particular, it is just going to add to the intimacy we experience with God as we build this habit of seeking him first in 2018. Well, prayer by definition, if we were just to define it, is, and I think many people would know this, it's a conversation with God. Prayer is a conversation with God. It's a conversation like you would have with your friend like you would have with your spouse, with your kid. It's a conversation, only you're not talking to your kid and you're not talking to your spouse. You're talking to the God of the universe, the God who knows the number of hairs on your head, the God, the God who formed you and knit you together in your mother's womb, the God on the day who you were born said, look at what I've made. Isn't she beautiful? The God who made you and said, look at this guy. He is a future warrior. We get to have a conversation with that God. And it's a conversation that's going to result in his glory. Now, when you think about prayer and you present your request to him and you're having a conversation, how do we often think about prayer? We want God to answer our prayer. But what happens when God answers our prayer? We praise him. It's for him. It's for his glory. Like, Lord, thank you for hearing my prayer. Lord, thank you for answering my prayer. Listen, if God doesn't answer it the way that you think he should, or if he doesn't answer your prayer the way that you wanted him to, guess what? He's still good. He still gets praise because, one, he loves you. Two, he heard you. And three, he answered. He gave you his answer. Isn't that good? That God isn't just some fictitious idea. That he's an actual being who created you and me. He's the all-powerful and he's loving and we get to have a conversation with him. I love this about prayer. Prayer is one of God's gifts to us. And I want to be really clear with this. We don't pray because we have to. Even though sometimes somebody in your life along the way may have said, you should pray more. And didn't you just want to tell them to be quiet? You should pray more. Doesn't that sound laborious? Doesn't that sound task-oriented? You should pray more. That just sounds like, I'll tell you what, it's, it's not that the message is wrong. It's just how it's packaged. Because yes, if we all knew the intimacy available to us with the Father, if we all knew how good it was to be in a conversation with him, to be able to bring all of our hurts, our habits, our hopes, our dreams, all of that, and to know that he cares and receive all of his love, his grace, his mercy, man, that would be more fun. You see, we don't pray because we have to. Let me put it this way. We pray because we get to. We get to. That is a privilege, you guys. It is a privilege to be able to talk to God. It is an honor. It is, oh my goodness, you, listen, this isn't a right. This is a gift to us from God. God has given us the ability to be able to have a conversation with him, to be able to know him. Isn't God good? God is incredibly good. It's where we get to bring, it's where we get to run after and invite him into something that's bigger than us. It's where we get to celebrate his goodness in our lives. It's where we get to take his will and our hope and forge them into a oneness that is one and the same and we're heading in, a, in the right direction. Isn't that a good thing? That's an amazing thing that we get to talk to God. Let me ask you a question. 
because I just want to live here for a minute because this is too good because he's too good to miss up on. Is there anybody in here brave enough to admit with me that there is somebody in your life that you got sideways with or they got sideways with you and you don't talk anymore? Anybody got those? There are a lot of broken people in this room. Starting right here. Just look around, man. Put those hands back up. Okay, now let me show you the goodness of God. There's sin that exists in our lives. It's the kind of thing that fractures relationship with God. It's the kind of thing that, that causes breakups. It's the type of thing that you get sideways. And God is so good, he doesn't say, stop coming to me. Rather, he says, come to me with it. Live in my love. Like God doesn't cut us off. Like he doesn't say, sorry, relationship's over, you blew it. He's like, he already knew that you were going to blow it. He knows all of your shortcomings, and guess what? He wants to hear from you, and somebody needs to hear that today because there's probably something in your life that you know shouldn't be there, and because it's there, you're not talking to him the way that you used to, and he's saying, all you have to do is come to me, repent of that, ask for forgiveness, it's yours. God wants to hear from you this morning. God wants you to live in his love this morning. God wants to actually have a conversation with you. The God who made you, the God who loved you, wants to be in conversation with you. That is truth. What a gift prayer is. Now let me tell you just a few misconceptions about prayer, and hopefully this will set some people free this morning. The first misconception about prayer is that you got to be good at it. And by good at it, I mean like the words are poetic coming out of your mouth. There are people who aren't praying right now because they've heard somebody else pray and because of the depth of that relationship or the way that they're just good with naturally gifted with words and it rolls off and it doesn't for you. You're like, man, I'm not going to pray because I'm not, I'm not good at it. Don't play the comparison game when it comes to prayers. Don't compare yours with somebody else. God's not looking at that. You want to know what he's looking at? This thing right here. The posture of our heart. The posture of our heart. You see, it's not what we're saying, and it's not how smooth it rolls out. It can roll out clunky, and it's okay. What matters is the fact that you're praying. I love what Max Licato says. This is, this is an awesome quote. This is what he says. He goes, our prayers may be awkward. Our attempts may be feeble. But since the power of prayer is in the one who hears it and not in the one who says it, our prayers make a difference. It doesn't matter if all you got is one sentence. That one sentence is enough. It doesn't matter if you stutter through that one sentence. It's enough. Did you know that Moses stuttered like a banshee? stutter. doesn't matter if it's clunky. It just matters that you're doing it. Don't buy into this misconception that I shouldn't pray because I'm not good at it. Listen, the only bad prayer that is Christ-centered is the one that is not being prayed. So man, I want to set some people free. If you're like, hey, I'm afraid to pray. No, start seeking God in prayer. The second misconception about prayer is this, is that prayer is all about me. I want to be really clear here. Prayer is God's gift to us, but it was never meant to be all about us. So many times we come to God and we just kind of pop in and say, Lord, bless me. Lord, help me. Lord, be with me. Lord, heal me. Lord, give me. And it's just me, 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 me. Now, if you had a friend that all they were ever doing was like, take, 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 would you want to be their friend? No, that relationship wouldn't last. But God is so patient, he is so loving that he endures that because he loves us. And I'm gonna tell you something, man, some of us have been ripping God off. We're just coming in and we've made it all about me. Prayer is for us, but it was never meant to be all about us. See, it's a conversation. It's where we engage God and then we zip our lips. And then we say, God, 
what do you have to say about this? And we wait and we get a response from him and then we kick it back to him. See, God will respond with us, but prayer was never meant to be all about us. Some of us have been cheating God and we got to stop that. We've got to engage him and say, Lord, what is it that you would like to do in my life today? What is it that you would like to address in my life today? Lord, is there something in me that is offensive to you? And if so, would you show me so that I can change that? See, it's a conversation. It was never meant to be all about us. See, God's gift, he's so good to us. He gives us the gift of prayer. God, his, his prayer is his idea. The third, uh, the third misconception about prayer, I love this one, is that prayer is boring. Like, hey, man, you, let's go to a prayer meeting. And all you hear is... <laughs> You're like, I'm not going to that thing. Let's be honest. We've probably given some people that opinion before. We've probably prayed some prayers that are so long that you started praying that they'd stop praying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Man, I, I may, you may have prayed that prayer. Like, Lord, please just help him be quiet right now. <laughs> you know? Hey, and if you're laughing at me, and trust me, I'm good, I'm good with that. I love that. But, man, if we're all laughing at that, chances are you've prayed that prayer too, that you prayed so long. Somebody's like, Lord, we get it, and I know that you got it 10 minutes ago. I just pray that you would cut their words off right now. You know, and what that's done, though, is this made prayer boring. And I want to tell you something. Like, prayer isn't boring. Like, seeking God about our praises and our requests, it is anything but boring. It is dynamic. Like, when we pray and God's a part of that conversation and we're seeking him, that's a conversation that can absolutely transform the world. Like, if you want your finances to be on a complete different trajectory this year, you can start with prayer. Like, if you want different results for your marriage in 2018, like, you're like, hey, there's some things we need to tighten up. There's some discrepancies. There's some things that just aren't right right here. Man, you can start. You want to make a difference? You start praying. Not that God would change them, but that God would change you. Start with me. Lord, what do you need to teach me? Listen, prayer is anything but idle, and it is anything but boring. Just a few days ago, how many of you guys are doing this prayer and fasting thing and going through the sticky stuff book with us? Every hand should be up right now, by the way. Okay, awesome. Thanks for not lying in church, though. That's really good. Good job. (laughs) Don't give up on that book. Don't give up seeking God first. Don't give up building that habit. But a few days ago, I think we were in 1 Chronicles uh, chapter 7. And God makes a promise about prayer. And he speaks directly to his followers. And we didn't plan this when we wrote the book and did the, doing the series, but it just tied so beautifully together. But God says, if my people would humble themselves, if they would turn from their wicked ways and seek me and pray, then what would he do? He would heal our land. Do you hear what you just said? Did you hear what God would do if we would humble ourselves, turn from our wicked ways? You want to know what I did when I read that? I started confessing everything wicked about my life I could possibly think of. Anything that I might still be a part of. I said, Lord, forgive me. I started turning, and it wasn't a 30-second prayer. I lived there. You want to know why? I believe God can heal our land. I believe he can do it. You want to know something else? I believe he wants to do it. He wants to do it. How serious are you about it? You want to be serious about it? Repent. Turn from any wickedness. Listen, there's idols in all of our lives, man. We've made idols out of silly stuff. Mike Fackler has made idols out of silly stuff. We're all guilty of it. If we would repent from our wickedness, if we would humble ourselves, if we would seek him and we would pray, he would do what? Heal our land. I'm telling you what, you want to engage in the most dynamic, powerful X amount of minutes in your life, in your day. You want to point your life in the right direction? Start believing prayer is not boring. Prayer is important because it's got the power to change the world we live in. 
He's got the power to do that. And God's saying, I'm not asking unbelievers to do this. I'm just asking my people to do this. We can be a part of something so much bigger by seeking him first. Listen, prayer is a lot of things, but boring is not one of them. Don't buy into that misconception. Now, the stickiest prayer that I know of is the Lord's Prayer. It's found in Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. If you don't know how to pray, Jesus actually gives us the blueprint how to pray. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13, it's the stickiest prayer of all, but it is not one of the four that we're going to look at today. But if, hey, if you want to learn how to pray and make your prayers more effective and to know the nuances of it, head to Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 9, Six, uh, Matthew chapter 6, 9 through 13, and Jesus actually, sh- actually shows us how to pray, and here's the beauty of it. The prayer starts with seeking God's glory, seeking God's recognition be known throughout the world. That's how it starts, seeking the greatness of God known to the world. That's an awesome way to pray. Stickiest prayer out there. But let's look at four other prayers that are sticky that we can actually attach to our lives that if we'll attach these prayers to the prayers that we're already praying and seeking God's will where he wants us as a church and where he wants us as individuals to serve him in 2018, there is something here for everybody. And the first prayer is, uh, is the prayer of Jabez and oh baby, I gotta go. All right, we're gonna fly. You ready? Okay, cool. Um, the first one's known as the prayer of Jabez. Jabez is just a blip on the radar in the Bible. I think he shows up in like three verses altogether, yet his presence in scriptures is seismic. We find him and a little bit about him in 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verse 9. And in verse 9, we find out two things about Jabez. One, we find out that he was more honorable than his brothers. Now, that doesn't mean his brothers were wicked. What that just means is God looked at him and saw him more honorable than his brothers. It meant that his passion for God ran a little bit hotter, that his obedience towards God was a little bit more intense. Like he was all about being obedient. He was more honorable than his brothers. But then we find out something really interesting about Jabez, that we would never want anybody else to know about us, but his mother named him Jabez, uh, which basically means I gave birth to him in pain. How would you like to, you, the, everybody, because everybody in that day and age, when they saw Jabez, they're like, doesn't that mean he was a real pain and pain to his mom? Now, a name like that could create a whole lot of obstacles to overcome in life. I mean, like, if your mom said, dude, it was a pain giving birth to you. Like, like you caused your mom pain. And that's the meaning of your name. Like, that is something that could limit a whole lot of us. Like, that is a a lens, that is a filter that we could see ourselves through that would totally squash any, any potential in our lives. But there was something about Jabez that he didn't let a label limit him. And there's some labels that you've been given that you've been letting limit you, that you've got to stop letting limit you, that you've got to break through that. You've got to say the only label that matters is that I'm a child of God, but he's got this wild random uh, label given him. Now in verse 10, here's what we see. We see that Jabez cried out, to the, to the God of Israel. And let me just tell you how big this prayer is. Like, whoever writing Chronicles interrupts the genealogy of the tribe of Judah to, to share this prayer. This prayer is huge. It's sticky. And this is what he says, Jabez prize, oh God, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me. Keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain. And how does this, how does this, how does this end? In God granted his request. Now there's a lot of scholars out there that believe that this prayer was uh, like uh, for prosperity, that this was a very self-centered, self-focused prayer. Like, Lord, if you would enlarge my, my holdings, if you would enlarge my territory, there's a lot of scholars that believe that, but there's a lot of other scholars that believe territory doesn't mean prosperity in that way. One of the most notable ones is a, is a theologian named Charles Spurgeon, and I'm more in line with his thinking. What I believe Jabez was praying there is not, Lord, uh, help me prosper. It was, Lord, increase my influence for your glory. Lord, increase my influence for you that more people might know you, that more people might praise your name. How many of you guys were here four o'clock on Christmas Eve? Is anybody in here? Not as many as last service. Okay. Four o'clock Christmas Eve, the service was absolutely slammed. It was jam-packed. It was packed. I want to tell you something. I believe every weekend here should be that way. I believe the potential exists for that to happen every weekend. And we're not trying to fill a building. What we're trying to say is, 
Let me just be honest. If we're living a Christ-centered life, if we're following Jesus, by the natural just what happens from following Jesus, our lives should be sticky. And people should see him. People should want him. And that should just healthy things grow. So quietly behind the scenes, what I've been praying over the past year for almost a full year now is what I've been quietly doing behind the scenes, not making a big, big deal about it, is I've been pray, praying the prayer, Jabez. Lord God, I pray that you would make us as a church, that you would increase our influence in our city, that you would increase our influence with people, that people may come to know you. I've been praying that prayer. And one of the things that we do to back it up is everybody who identifies themselves as a guest, if you've identified yourself as a guest, we're going to pursue a relationship with you. Now, ultimately, we're going to let you choose whether you want to be in one with us, and we hope that you do. But if we're asking God to enlarge our territory, then what we increase our influence, then we need to be faithful with what he's already given us, right? So we're just being faithful. And you want to know what happened in 2017? Our church grew. Our church grew. And you all, we all together play a part in this. You see, God has already given you territory. You just don't look at it that way. Or maybe you are and more of us need to look at it this way. But where we work, that's God's ground. Where we play, that's God's ground. Where we go out to eat, that's God's ground. Where we shop, that's God's ground. That's territory. That's relationships. Lord, that you would increase our influence in those areas for your glory. That people would know you. It'll change the way you look at life. Enlarge my territory. Sticky, sticky prayer. Here's the second one. Ope, I call this the prayer of open my eyes that I might see. I love this one. And you guys, we don't have time for it. You need to check this out on your own. But go to 2 Kings chapter 6 because this is an absolutely riveting story. And so let me just quickly paraphrase for you. There is a guy who is coming against the people of Israel. But God loves his people and he wants his people to turn back to him. And so God is giving them, is his people, every chance to repent. And what he's done is he's given his prophet named Elisha insight into the battle plans of the bad guys. The bad guy's name is Ben-Hadad. He's a king of Syria, I believe. And he's coming against Israel. And so every time that Ben-Hadad and the Syrian army tries to come against Israel, God has already informed a prophet named Elisha what's going on. And he's warned Israel. So every time this guy goes to a attack, he's always missing. And so he asks his men, hey, which one of you guys in here is the mole? Who's telling Israel what we're doing? And they say, nobody. There's a prophet of God named Elisha who God is giving insight into your battle plans and he's telling Israel what's going on. And so Ben-Hadad says, we need to put an end to Elisha's life. And so they find out where Elisha is. There, Elisha is sleeping. Ben-Hadad and his army circle the city in, in efforts to take his life. They're, they're there for the purpose of taking him out. And when Elisha's servant wakes up in the morning and he goes out to the wall, he looks over the wall, what do you think he sees? He sees a huge army. And he knows that they're there for him and for Elisha. So what does he do? I mean, it's the only thing that he can do because he's all there by himself. He freaks out. He goes and grabs Elisha. And let's look at the prayer here. He says, Elisha, look at what's going on. And look at how Elisha responds. Don't be afraid. Isn't that a message that Jesus has told to you and I over and over and over again? Don't be afraid. I'm with you. Don't be afraid. I'm with you. Elisha says, don't be afraid, the prophet answered. The prophet answered, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Now the servant, in fairness to him, is looking out and he's seeing thousands of people. And in fairness to the servant who can't see, he's probably looking at Elisha and he's like, dude, I know you haven't had coffee yet, but you're saying let, there's more? This is you and me, man. And so what did Elisha say? He prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he might see. That is a sticky prayer. Because when he prayed that prayer, the Lord opened his servant's eyes and he looked and he saw the hills full of horses and the chariots of fire all around Elisha. And the only thing more terrifying, the only thing more intimidating that he saw was the armies of the living God there to protect his man. Open our eyes that we might see. It's a sticky prayer that'll change your life. It bears asking the question, how come Elisha wasn't afraid? 
How come he wasn't afraid? What was it about Elisha's faith? And there's something that we can learn there. And here's what I want to quickly tell you is this. Is that God has made some promises to his people. That I am for you. That I love you. That I will be with you. I'll defend you. I'll fight on your behalf. You only need to be still and trust me. And there's a bunch of his people that are running around not living in that promise. Why was Elisha able to be calm? Because he believed in the promises of God. And guess what? He believed more than the promises of God. He believed that those promises were his. He owned those babies. Those are like, God made me a promise. That promise is mine. And he owned it. And he lived in it. And he was confident not in who he was. He wasn't confident in who God says he is. And so therefore he didn't fear. And so when I say that the prayer is sticky, open the eyes that I might see, Lord, we need, some of us in here need to believe that prayer. And not just believe it, but we need to believe that God's promises are for us too. Like they're for me too. Some of us this morning, open my eyes, Lord, that I might live in your promises. Open the, eyes of my, uh, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, that I might see you. Open my eyes that I might see you. That is a prayer because if we're not living in it, we need to pray that prayer. Lord, open my eyes that I might see that I'm not living in your promises so that I can start today. Open, open my eyes that I might see. It is a sticky prayer. Third prayer, it's unlike anything the rest. I will power read through here, but it is too good to miss out on. John chapter 17, you've already turned there, six verses. This is not any prayer. These are the words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, spoken to God the Father on our behalf. What we are about to read here is the Son of the Most High God who came, died on the cross, purchased our freedom through the shedding of his blood and rose, rose from the dead. These are his words on our behalf. And listen to what he says. My prayer is not for them alone. He was talking about the disciples. My prayer is also for those who will believe in me through the message. I am praying right now, Father. That's what he's praying. Jesus is praying for all of those, all of us who would ever call on the name of Jesus to be, to be saved. And this morning, if you're not in a personal relationship with Jesus, that is why he came. And what you need to know is he prayed for you. He loves you. But if you are a follower of his, these words are just for us. That all of them may be one father. I'm praying that every follower of Jesus may be one father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. In them and you and me, may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved me even as you have loved me. What Jesus is saying right there is that he was so one with the Father, his life stu stuck out to a broken, sinful world. Everybody knew that Jesus came from God. Now, not everybody liked Jesus, and that's why they put him to death for it, uh, on the cross. But it was undeniable that Jesus came from God. Now, here's the truth. When we are living in this truth, when we are following Jesus Christ, when we are living our life as one with Christ, when we are being led by the Spirit, it is an undeniable unmistakable difference that our lives will look, look different to a lost and dying world. Jesus is saying it right here, that there is no blending in. Your life will look different. People will say, that guy loves God. That guy loves Jesus. That gal loves Jesus. That woman loves Jesus. It'll be unmistakable. And then I love what Jesus says in 20, uh, verse 24. Father, I want those you've given me to be with me where I am. And to see my glory, the glory you've given me because you've loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you. And they know that you've sent me. I've made you known to them and I'll continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them. And that I myself may be in them. You see, Jesus knew that God loved them. And he wants that same love for you to experience the same thing. I call that the prayer of unity. You see, Jesus' prayer is trifold. It's for oneness, that we might be one with God through the Spirit of God and Jesus Christ the way Jesus was. The second part of that prayer is that our oneness with one another would be unified in Christ. And the third part is that unity and oneness in Christ would reveal God's glory to the world. One commentator says about Christ's prayer this way, the church possesses a mission, 
a cause, just as Jesus had a mission in the world. The unity of the church and the quality of its life and experiences lead not only to the glory of God, but to a powerful testimony to the world. Our oneness in Christ, our oneness together is a powerful testament. It's a powerful picture to the world of God's redeeming love. Not just our presence here, but our unity together in that Jesus is Lord. Our belief that God wants to use us. Our action out in our world shows to the world that God is good. Man, Christians doing the work of God is a powerful testimony to God's goodness. Man, isn't that cool? But let me tell you something else. When Christians are divided, that's also a powerful testament that we're full of it. Which one do you want to be a part of, first or second? I believe one person in here. What do you want to be a part of, the first or the second? Okay, now, dude, I believe you. Nobody believed the 9 o'clock people, but I believe deep in their hearts they want that. I believe you. I believe that. That's what God wants. So that is a powerful prayer. It's a sticky prayer. Lord, help us be unified. Last prayer, and here we go. It's a prayer of boldness. The Apostle Paul, I call it the prayer of boldness. The Apostle Paul, he's in chains. And he's talking to the church in Ephesus. In Ephesians 6, 19 through 20, he says, he asks the church to pray for him. He says, pray for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will what? Fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am ambassador. Pray that I might declare it. Oh man, we got to get a lot fiercer than that. As he's saying, help me declare it fearlessly as I should. Here's what that verse tells us. Here Paul is in chains. He's in chains for uttering the name of Jesus. He's in chains for the name of Jesus Christ. He's in chains for the gospel. And he's like, church, pray for me. When I stand before the emperor, pray that I'd be fearless. Pray that I'd make the gospel clear. When I'm in front of my prison guards, when I'm in front of my captive, pray I'd be fearless and make the gospel known. Let me tell you what that looks like today. Lord, when I'm standing before my boss and there's something that I've got to say that exalts your name, help me be fearless. When I'm standing around people that don't really believe in you, God, help me be fearless. It's the prayer of boldness. It's a prayer that stick. In all of these prayers, come back to this one. Lord, help me be bold and dare pray, enlarge my territory. Lord, help me be bold and pray, open my eyes that I might see and live in. Lord, help me be bold and pray for my brothers and sisters in this room that we would be one as we are one. Lord, help me be bold and declare your word fearlessly in my life. Now, a week ago we started this journey where we're building this habit of seeking God first through prayer and fasting. And one of these four prayers is going to be more sticky this morning than the rest. Like well, you're going to need one of these. You, one of these stands out more than the rest. That's the prayer you need to attach to the ones that you're already praying. Lord God, thank you so much for time to worship you this morning. Thank you for a chance to open up your word. I wanna say thank you for the gift of prayer. I wanna say thanks for not cutting us off. I wanna say thanks for wanting to hear from us, wanting the best for us, wanting yourself for us. Lord, I pray that you would hear all of our prayers, that you would grant the request of showing us where we can bless others and bring glory and honor to your name in 2018. Help us be a praying people. Help us be bold in Jesus' name. Amen.